Hey everybody, it's Derek Kilmartin from CodeOpinion.com and everybody seems to love best practices and rules around designing a REST API. But is all this guidance actually good advice? Let's find out. So here's a list that I found. It's from Jeff Snitzer. I'll have a link in the description and there are 12-ish rules. Some of these rules will probably seem pretty standard to you, but I'm gonna be pushing back on some of them. This isn't really a hot take, it's more so that they become the norm or the standard, and I really don't know if they should be. So the first rule is to use plural nouns for collections. It's an arbitrary convention, but well established that they found that violations tend to be a leading indicator of that the API will have rough edges. There's no technical reason why one is better than the other, that's exactly why you should stick to one common convention your client developers already expect. And as you probably typically already know, the slash products rather than slash product, et cetera. Now, before I push back on rule number one, it relates to rule number two, which is don't add unnecessarily path segments. So a common mistake seems to be trying to build out your relational model into your URL structure. And they're giving kind of an example of Etsy, where you have the V3 application listings and then the listing ID versus what they were saying was bad in theirs is that you had the shop ID even though the listing ID was actually globally unique. Before I push back on these first two rules, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So what would my pushback be against this? It all seems pretty standard. Well, it's the idea that really was mentioned in the second part about kind of your database structure and relationship structure. But it's really going back to thinking about nouns, entities, and that being revolving around how you deal with your HTTP API or REST API. And I threw up air quotes around REST for this exact reason, which is mentioned in here, which I find a little bit amusing, is that most developers today understand REST as some sort of HTTP-based API with noun-based URLs. The term was coined to mean something slightly different, but language changes. Don't worry about what or isn't REST, focus on building pragmatic, useful APIs. If that's the case, if we're trying to be pragmatic, one, these shouldn't be rules. Sure, we can take them all with a grain of salt. But two, it's that now everybody really terms around our HTTP API or REST is really based around noun-based URLs, which is exactly what those first two rules were about, about noun-based URLs and defining URL structures in this way, and those nouns specifically being about entities. Then all of a sudden, we really turn in our system into CRUD-driven APIs around nouns or entities and trying to force this idea of HTTP methods, they're not verbs, they're methods around CRUD. So if everything we're gonna do around this, likely our rules are gonna be driven by this, but should it be that way? Now I understand if the industry as a whole is terming REST this way, we're developing HTTP APIs in a particular way, I understand the kind of the desire to just follow the trend. However, that's not really being pragmatic if that actually doesn't fit what you're actually trying to build. So when we're talking about URIs and URLs and actually generating these, I'll have videos that I've done on hypermedia, but just because not everybody under the sun is using hypermedia doesn't mean that you can't to resolve some of these issues to not even care about URL structures. So the idea being is that your responses are driving your actual, your consumers, your clients, so they're not actually constructing URIs. If they're not constructing URIs, then those two first two rules that I mentioned are not even applicable anymore. So for example, if we had our listings that we were returning a part of our response and we wanted to actually have our client at that point, whatever it may be, some front end, be then looking at our responses to understand how it can navigate to get more data related to a listing, it's using the links that we're providing to it. It's looking at this, this name, this listing, this type of key, that's what's static to it that can't really change. But the, this href, this URI, it could be whatever we want it to be. Let's say that we were originally, it was listing and we weren't following that uh, mode and we changed it. That doesn't affect the client. We didn't break the client at all. I'll have again a mention, a link to hypermedia and think about this way, but this just abolishes those first two rules. Rule number three, I actually haven't heard people doing this, so I'm a little scared, is don't add .json or other extensions to the URL. 100% agree. You can use your accept header to have different representations of the resource. So whether it's typically just JSON, maybe you're gonna add some new custom JSON header that is for accepting something like hypermedia as your own specific custom representation. You can use your accept header. You don't need to be using extensions in your URI for that. 
Rule number four, don't return a raise as top level responses. 100% agree, because it handcuffs you when you're returning an array. The example here is instead having an object return data as a property, then your array, rather than directly your array. Why is that? Because it's handcuffing you. If you want to add more properties, more data to that, you don't have to version it or have a different URI, completely different resource. So for example, they're saying if you added a total count or has more because there's some type of pagination, the idea here being that you're really handcuffed if you return an array. Don't return an array as your top level result. Rule number five, don't return map structures. Can't say I've run into this a lot or even realized this was an issue, but I agree it's probably a good rule because depending on what type of server side language you're using for generating the responses, I could see if you're using these types of structures, why these would start getting exposed. But then on the flip side, not really thinking about your consumers and what languages they're using consuming these types of structures. So just strict with typical collections arrays. Rule number six, do you use strings for all identifiers? I agree and disagree with this one. So the gist of it is because maybe your identifier, even though it's in the database as a numeric value as an integer, you still want to return it as a string. Why? Because you can represent it a little bit differently. Maybe you have some segmentation, your system evolves, your database evolves, how you partition data. This allows you to do this a little bit differently if you have a string based on how you're returning the data and then assuming then your clients are sending that data to say perform some type of action. Now the thing is, is that's what I'm mentioning, is let's go back to that first two rules where I was talking about hypermedia, where generally your IDs, because your URI structures, generally that's where your IDs are, they become opaque, you don't care about them, you're providing your client with links, URIs for different data that they can get or perform some type of action. Your IDs at that point are really opaque to your clients, so it doesn't even become a concern. To illustrate this quickly, let's say this is our response. We have our ID, it's just really numeric, but we're returning as a string as one, two, three. We don't actually even need to return it. Why? Because our clients and consumers, they don't actually need the ID because they're not constructing a URI because they're not constructing a URI because we're providing it for them. So if we're providing the action on how to cancel an order, here's our identifier within the URI. This could be whatever we want to return. They don't need the ID because they're not constructing the URI. We're giving it to them. Rule number seven, do prefix your identifiers. Even if you're using something like Hypermedia and you still want to be returning responses that have identifiers in them, prefixing your URIs is helpful. It's very helpful actually. And I've done a video on this where people pushed a lot against it about me saying that something readable, something understandable when you're looking at an ID, what it actually represents. I do think it's a good idea. There's a lot of pushback and people, a lot of people don't like the idea of returning an ID that's something meaningful, not even just prefixes. But I think a lot of this just comes down to the types of system you're building, how big they are. And if you have a lot of identifiers, a lot of support, a lot of people, you'll probably get the gist of why this can be helpful. Rule number eight is gonna be a touchy one. Don't use 404s to indicate not found. The HTTP specs that you should use a 404 to indicate that a resource was not found. A literal interpretation suggests that you should return a 404 for a get, put, delete, etc., to an ID that does not exist. Please do not do this, hear me out. No, hear me out. Never mind what everybody's doing, but just accepting reality of what things are. What's a resource? Well, it can be whatever you want it to be. What's a URI? A URI may be used to identify anything, including a real world object, such as people, places, concepts, or information resources such as web pages and books. A URI is a re identifier to a resource. What's a resource? Whatever you want. It does not need to be an entity. It does not need to be related to that URL structure that you had that represented some identifier that represented a database record. Now this post used an example of kind of a two-phase commit and distributed system. Never mind all that, but what I found really interesting was this statement is that instead of using a 404, they use a 410 gone. This diverges slightly from the original intent, meaning a 410 is it existed, but now it's not, but nobody actually uses that error. What I found really amusing about this is that kind of the rest of this post I think was going in the path of, well, the industry as a whole does this, so kind of just do that so that way your consumers are familiar with things. But in this case, it's saying, okay, don't return a 404 when you have an identifier or something in your database missing. Rather, you can use a 410, and that's what I'm gonna use in this circumstance because nobody uses it though. It's like, well, what are we talking about then? Following the industry standard? Or in their case, thinking that was more pragmatic. I don't get it. Rule number nine, be consistent. 1000% agree, being consistent in the naming and in the structure. 
So they're saying it's maddening where you have a country prop field. Then in another place, another resource, it's country name. And then somewhere else, it's country code. No, just be country, however you're defining that, whatever the structure is. I get things evolve, so this is applicable, and this happens to all of us, but try to be consistent. Rule number 10, do use a structured error format. 100% agree. Probably the most common that people use is this RFC, which is problem details. I'd assume that every type of server-side language or whatever you're using supports this now as a response when you want to return some type of error, use problem details if you want to use a standard. Rule number 11, do provide item potence mechanisms. This is a good suggestion, but how you implement it is a little bit interesting. So the idea with item potence is that you make a request, let's say for example, it's taking a long time and you end up getting a timeout. But that's not to say the operation on the server didn't actually occur. So if the client makes that exact same request and their example submitting an order, you wouldn't want two orders submitted. So a common way that this is achieved, I'll scroll down a little bit here, is using some type of uh, header in their example, using an item potent key. And this can work, a lot of services do this, but there's another way. Now it's worth mentioning that there's some operations that are gonna be in your system that are just naturally item potent. But if they're not, and you're gonna have something in the header like the item potent key that was suggested there, that still requires your clients to actually do it and do it correctly. Imagine if there was a way to do this where your clients didn't have to think about it. Could, would you be shocked if I said hypermedia again? Back to the sample where I was showing the actual response of an order and having the actions that you could cancel an order, guess what this is? The add impotent key. If we're trying to get this response, we make this request multiple times, there's our key. There's the item potent key, it's in our URI. We don't have to construct it, we don't have to put it in a header, it's right there. Last rule, rule number 12, use the ISO strings for timestamps, inbound and outbound. And I agree with this, here's the example of it that you'll see with the Z for Zulu time in UTC zero. But I'm gonna add a little bit to this. I'm gonna have a link at the very end of this video to a video I've done about storing date times, specifically not just UTC, because date times in the future, not so much. You actually need to understand what time zone related to that date time that was the literal value entered. And if you did that conversion to UTC, because time zones change in the future, they can change in the future, so can daylight savings times rules can change. So when we're talking about date times in the future, how you're thinking about those, it's not just as simple as, okay, everything is UTC zero, but I do agree with this rule as inbound and outbound, returning them as your ISO string. Overall, I think this guidance is pretty good. I don't necessarily view them as rules. I don't really ever think as rules in general, kind of thinking more about context. I think what's really amusing to me though, is that we have different specifications, we did have different RFCs, but we seemingly just ignore them because the industry as a whole has ignored them. That's kind of where I go off the board here a little bit is I don't really feel that way. Just because everybody else is doing something which I think is wildly incorrect does not mean I'm going to just to make their life easier. If like, oh, the consumers think that URLs should be constructed this way. So the industry is doing it that way. So I'm gonna do URL construction this way. Or maybe I won't have that problem at all and I won't force them to define URLs and I'll be using something like hypermedia even though the majority of people aren't doing it, and then I can just remove a whole subset of issues. Do I get trade-offs and have some other issues because of it? Absolutely yes. But I think just more so is realizing that when you see particular rules, they're not really rules. They're kind of general guidelines, depending on the context, what your application's like. It did mention it, which I agree with. Just be pragmatic. If you enjoy topics like this and you want to chat with other software developers, I have a private Discord server where I have over 300 members where you can communicate and chat about topics like this on software architecture and design, ask questions, provide your own opinions and answers. Check the links in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions related to any of these rules, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.